The Iron Age began thousands of years ago and yet it's only in the last three or four hundred years that we've actually begun to make iron in quantity and quality. Why is that? Let's find out. Hello, my name's Anthony and I'm an enthusiast. I love discovering stories about how people and technologies helped the world to make things and do things quicker, cheaper and easier. And today I'm looking at the story of iron production. In particular, I want to learn more about how we went from small scale iron production to the larger scale volume production that thrust the world into the modern age. Now I'm no historian. According to Wikipedia, there's evidence of blast furnace activity in China going back thousands of years. But I don't live in China. There's also evidence of the earliest blast furnace activity in Europe, in Sweden, dating back to the 12th century. But I don't live in Sweden. I live in England, which is why I've come here. A few bell pits down that way suggest that there's been ironstone mining going on since maybe the 15th or 16th century. Quite a long time. And we know that Gervais Rockley left his ironsmithy in his will in 1604. The remains of his ironsmithy used to be over there till they were bulldozed to build the M1 motorway. A local ironmaster called Lionel Copley built his first furnace somewhere around here in 1652. He agreed to produce 40 tonnes of iron a year and pay five pounds per tonne to the local landowner. But that furnace is long gone. This place though was built in 1704 by Lewis Westcombe. He borrowed the money to build it from the Spencer family at Cannon Hall. This furnace is made up of three walls. The outer wall used to be faced with smooth stone, a little like the stone that you can see at the base. And inside the furnace was a, a large sandstone pot and then in between the infill was this rubble that you can see today. The key ingredients to iron making was ironstone which was mined locally plus charcoal which they made from the trees in the local woods and some limestone that they used to use as a kind of flux to help separate the iron from the uh, slag. You used to mix all of the ingredients down here, uh, pre-prepared, and then they wheel it up this ramp, and there used to be a bridge across from the edge of the ramp, across the top of the furnace. They'd wheel it across and dump it in down the throat. They'd fill it up continuously, and then each day they'd drain off or tap the molten iron out of the bottom of the furnace. Unfortunately the hearth, the, the bottom of the pot, is all missing. You can see straight up to the sky if you stand at the bottom. This is the blowing arch where they used to blow air down a cast iron tube, blast of air into the furnace, hence the name blast furnace. Underneath here somewhere there's the remains of the um, bellows house. Huge leather bellows to blow the air, blast it into the furnace. It used to be powered by a water wheel. 
One of the drawbacks to having water wheels drive your bellows is that during the summer months, when there's not a lot of water, there's a risk that the bellows will stop working. Which probably explains why the furnace was only ever operated between October and May when it's raining. Well, when it's raining around here. This is a casting arch where every day the workers would drain or tap some of the iron, the molten iron, out to the base of the furnace into a trough that ran down here and into um, individual moulds that ran off. The central trough was called a sow and the individual moulds were called pigs. And this is how we get the term pig iron. Pig iron wasn't much good on its own because it was quite brittle and it had loads of impurities in it. So the furnace used to send its pig iron to local forges where they would hammer it and heat it and hammer it and heat it until they'd hammered out most of the impurities and turned it into wrought iron. Rockley fell out of use about 1750-ish. Not entirely sure why. The owner at the time, Mr Cotton, died in 1749. They lifted the import duties on cheap American iron. And then of course, the biggie for me I think, was they ran out of charcoal. All the trees, woods, there's only so much you can chop down and burn. There's a big problem at this point in the Industrial Revolution, shortage of charcoal. Another possible explanation could lie in that direction, about 100 miles away. Abraham Darby and his sons pioneered and perfected the use of coke as a fuel for blast furnaces. And coke was made from coal, no need for charcoal. One of the drawbacks to using coke instead of charcoal was that the coke contained lots of impurities, like sulphur. That meant that the iron produced was, well, rubbish. With the introduction of steam engines to replace water wheels, so a huge increase in the efficiency of blast furnaces, because they could use them 24-7, 365 days of the year, unlike this furnace, which was used for barely six months of the year. But then came the Napoleonic Wars. Rockley was relit, this time using coke. Under here, there's a unique circular casting pit. Just the right sort for casting cannon. But the work didn't last long. Rockley stopped producing not long after it was relit. Nobody's sure why. The records don't show when or why it went out of use again. But Rockley was never used again. Rockley tells us a lot about this period. The introduction of coal, the introduction of steam, transformed the iron making business. It enabled newer furnaces that were much bigger to produce better quality iron in ever greater volumes. So there we have it, Rockley Blast Furnace. One of, if not the oldest, surviving blast furnace that was originally designed to burn charcoal but was converted to use coal. If you want to enjoy more stories like this, please consider subscribing and remember to hit that notifications button to make sure that you get uh, notified every time we put a new video up. And uh, thank you for watching, and if you haven't already, join the revolution. <laughs>